Hello everyone. Let's just make sure that we're we're live. And I believe we are. So we're going to get right into it and then we will come back and uh, talk about everything when we're done. Okay. So this is about the Avery Bimbenic Blueprint. And it's a 12 point connection summary of what we've went over in the last five videos. The names that are in both cases is the Attorney General Van Hollen state of the top of the state and Peg Lautenschlager. The state assistant DA who then becomes the DA is Norm Gaughan and he handles the DNA and works for Attorney General. The state crime lab head supervisor Michael Camp of the Milwaukee Crime Lab is um, in line with the evidence control and testing in both the um, both cases. He's involved in both. And then the state prosecutor, um, who was the county DA for Calumet, Ken Kratz, um, there's a whole government scandal because of a sex stain that gets covered up by these same individuals in both cases. And so Kratz gets mentioned way before ma'am in the Bimbenic um, case later on, in like 2010, 2011. Now, what's interesting is the Bambenic case actually stems from 1981 or when we start hearing about photographs and such. The case is still ongoing, even though she's passed away. Um, there are those that are still filing for her exoneration. And she was she died wrongfully convicted of murder. And so in the research over the past five videos that we've done, we want to gather that information and share it with you. So if you, let me see if I can do the whole YouTube thing. Right here is our community and it's the no time, uh, no, no crime, no time dot org community. And you can join us there. We have a forum going on that is uh, wonderful and that's where you can connect with us. So this is the Avery Bimbetic Blueprint 12 point connection. So, as we start off with it, we've got exposing corruption. Bambenic was exposing corruption, and so was Avery. Bambenic um, had become a police officer. She was accused of smoking marijuana and was being reprimanded for that when she produced photographs of um, officers, fellow officers engaged in um, criminal illegal drug act as well as um, nude dancing on picnic tables minors are present um, and she questioned if she was being treated unfairly and it caused depositions it caused an investigation that's what we have in the Avery case depositions investigation into the behavior of law enforcement so there's where we've got our first you know, where we can compare and we can go, okay, right here is Stephen Avery, right here is Ben Benick, and they're mirroring each other in the case. They both start off with the whole corruption. Now, Steve Avery's, of course, was. He was wrongfully convicted for many years, he said, in prison. And it looked like during the depositions that it was apparent, or becoming apparent, I should say, that nine years of it could be almost proven that the county knew he was innocent and had not acted upon it or taken any action to relieve him of his incarceration. So, Ben Bannock's case was that when she produced these photographs, along comes um, this other cop, co-partner co type cop, that she starts having a relationship with and marries. And this cop happens to be, coincidentally, the photographer of the nude photos that she just turned in. Okay? So follow me on that. Now, eventually his ex-wife ends up dead and Ben Benick's framed for that. But let's keep going. Sloppy Ellie investigation. Um, if you look at the Avery case... How sloppy can you get? We're repackaging evidence. They're losing evidence. We have no bones. They've been given back to the hall box. Now they're saying they might be animal bones. When you look over at the Bimbenic case, we have bullets that are signed out or um, 
I'm sorry, let me correct that statement completely. Bullets that are not signed out in the change of, chain of custody showing that they've moved at all with experts over here saying at this other location um, that they can they can say that the bullet is this or that. Uh uh. You don't even have it. It's over here in the crime lab. So you can see what the evidence is a very sloppy investigation. Um, the coroner in the Avery case is barred from the Avery property and threatened to be arrested if she violates the standing order, the verbal order. When you look at the Ben Bennett case, we have Samuel, who is the um, the ME, the medical examiner, and there's, she actually basically turns against, she comes forward, she's a whistleblower, and she states, you know, yeah, I sealed an envelope, and I put the date and time on it in the evidence, but what I put in there isn't what the state produced out of that envelope, and she goes on to um, thoroughly question what in the heck is going on because it isn't making sense to her. And she's finding that there's too many um, things that are being done that are not ever done in any other cases. So she comes forward. And both the coroner in the Avery case, as well as the ME, um, the medical examiner, both of them in the Bembenic and the Avery case, um, they, they express fear you know, genuine fear. So I believe them to be whistleblowers and they're both on the side of the victim. Next, number four, we have alleged murder weapons unfired. Now, what we mean by that is, when was it ever tested that the gun that was supposedly in the Avery case was ever actually fired? So is there a blowback on the gun? Um... Where are these results? What's the rifling of that barrel? Where are all the results on the actual weapon itself? And then you look at the Ben Bennett case and the actual murder weapon has the same thing because you've got the off-duty revolver of this cop that starts dating her. His ex-wife is now dead. They're pinning it on Ben Bennett because she's there with the off-duty weapon in the apartment. Later we know um, that it's actually the on-duty revolver and that this cop was on duty that matches the the impression on the back of his ex-wife's back, the homicide victim's back. My nose is itching. I'm trying to be polite, but I can't. I just got itch it. This is a huge one. Oh my gosh. Okay, guys, number five. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Crime lab one time deviation in the history of our crime labs of Wisconsin. Colhane deviates from protocol to allow them to put that bullet in evidence that says it has Teresa Halbach's DNA on it. Zellner has proved that that is not bone or blood. So we'll, we'll leave that rabbit hole alone. But keep in mind, Colhane had to fill out a deviation protocol for that, and her supervisor at Madison did not sign off on that. She went over to Milwaukee Crime Lab for that. Who's the supervisor? Michael Camp, right? So we have this huge deviation where she spits on the bullet. It's actually the standard. So she's trying to say it didn't affect the evidence. When the whole test, the whole protocol says right there that what's, you know, happens to this sample could be happening to the actual evidence. And so therefore you have to throw it out. It has to be inconclusive, right? But Sherry bends the protocol by getting the, the Milwaukee Crime Lab supervisors to sign off for her so that she can introduce this evidence into trial as a match. Go to the Ben Bennett case. It's a bullet again. They, it, it, and in both of them, they alter the protocol for a window of time and then flip it back into place. So they basically break the rule, the critical rule um, in both cases. So if you look at the Ben Bennett case, the problem is that it requires two people 
to both examine the bullet fragment or the bullet to come to the same conclusion for a match. Same kind of case, right? But the state changes rules and says they're only going to allow one person to do it. And now it doesn't qualify as as um, a match. It's inconclusive. And, and it just gets, it's baloney. The whole thing gets so complex, but it all boils down to why is a state crime lab altering the protocol that's good for everybody else but Ben Benick and Stephen Avery? They have, they, they changed the law. Who's in charge of that? Well, let's look at how this goes. All right. So if you go down here, I, I'm trying to highlight it in blue. The attorney general, Van Hollen, I believe that's his name anyway. He's, he's the top of this. He's the attorney general's boss, if you will. Okay. Norm Gaughan acts as a DNA expert. He's the one that helped write the law and he got awards for it on how to preserve DNA evidence if you were incarcerated due to the use of that evidence, how to biologically preserve that evidence to protect those people from ever being wrongfully convicted again like Stephen Avery. And now it's completely ironic that Norm Gaughan's the one that took part in releasing the biological evidence used to convict Brendan and Stephen Dassey. It, it, unfathomable. <laughs> Norm Gaughan played both roles. He played the same role in the Ben Benick case. He was the one that stood up against Ben Benick every single time and fought any type of DNA testing. Same in the Avery case. Yeah, oh yeah, you can test the bones. Saying that in bad faith, knowing full well they didn't have the bones to test. So who has to sign off for this? Well, you have to get somebody like, um, you know, we forgot somebody really important on this. And that is Mark Williams. I wonder if we can add that. So Mark Williams, let me see if this is it right here, is the one that butt dialed Zellner. And he's the one that is a lawyer for Norm Gaughan, the state. He's the state's lawyer. And he's the one trying to set it up so that Zellner gets that butt dialed call and is led to believe that the state unknowingly may have released the bones. Mark Williams. Mark Williams is the one in the Bam Bennett case that um, says, hey, to the head of the Milwaukee Crime Lab, I need you to put a document in there to cover up and back what we're saying in court because they're going to look at the file. And that document needs to evaporate the whole Bimbenic file, make it look like it, it went through a flood, got washed away. Just evaporate the evidence. Mark Williams gives the order. Who does that? Michael Camp, Milwaukee State Crime Lab, who's the one also auditing the Madison Crime Lab during the Steve Avery trial. Okay, so we've got him on there. Let's save that. All right, let's jump down to number six. State witnesses purged themselves with DA knowledge. Avery case, star witness, Bobby Dassey, perjured himself. Because he states later on, and we have other witnesses that said, he saw Teresa drive off. Brad, um, no, Brian Dassey stated that in his testimony. And then also, um, we have that call between Barb and Scott with Stephen. And Barb admits, yeah, he saw her drive off. Stephen's like, well, that's not what you said in the trial. Why didn't anybody say the truth, Right. So we have the star witness, a state witness, perjure themselves on the stand and the DA knows it. The DA knows it. And guess who's sitting right beside King Kratz in the Stephen Avery trial? Norm gone. Fallon. Both of them two have got King Kratz's back. 
Look at Scott Tadich's. Oh, the fire was hardly... I mean, the fire just all of a sudden comes into being over time. It doesn't start the whole story off with Scott saying, yeah, there was a fire. Huge. Wouldn't that be the first thing you'd tell the cops if you were given your eyewitness and you're innocent and you find out that some girl may have been murdered somewhere and you were in the parking lot and you saw this huge fire? Wouldn't it be the first thing that popped in your head? No, not with Scott Tadich. We find that out much later as his story develops and changes and gets molded by the state. Well, those are your two witnesses that are also primary suspects from the defense's standpoint. They were actually named in um, the Denny prere uh, prerequisites that were filed in the original 2005 or 2007, I should say, case. So when they were saying, you know, who do you think your suspects will be and can you prove them a motive and that they had... Um, the ability, the access to the victim. Can you prove there was a connection to the victim? There were many people named. Scott Tadich and Bobby Dassey were named. And they turned out to be the star witnesses. DA knew they're full of crap. You look at the Ben Bennett case and the man, the cop that took the nude photos that Ben Bennett's turning in, sweethearts her and then turns against her in the trial on his own ex-wife's murder, and he's a witness to her when it's his on-duty revolver that's tested positive to type A blood on the, on the barrel is compatible with blowback results of being pressed against skin when fired, And he's a witness against Ben Bennett. Okay, number seven. Big one for me. The exes are not investigated as suspects. Ryan Hillegas, chosen as a leader, chosen to be treated as Kratz said, an unofficial law enforcement, allowed behind the crime um, grid the actual secure crime grid allowed on property when few investigators are there. Most are down on Cuss Road the same day as the electronics surface is the best way to put it. Well, Schultz is the guy that's testifying against Ben Benick, him and his partner, who lie about their alibi and get caught lying about their alibi. Schultz is already under investigation for many other things at the time that her trial takes place. Investigators were investigating him criminally into this case and are asked to hold off until Ben Bennett has her pre-trial underway first. And when they wait and then they go to the DA and to the attorney general and ask for the investigation to now continue because they've complied to wait, they're basically brushed off and there's no investigation at all. Number eight, bullets were, be, were unable to be tested by defense. What do I say here that we don't already know? Um, Sherry Cole handcuffs on the bullet, that's one thing. But to knowingly choose to use up an ample sample, why would you do that unless... Unless you don't want anybody to ever test that bullet again, which is nefarious as hell. And so Colhane used up all the bullet and it's all gone. Now the defense can't do anything about it. Defense can't come in and witness the test they're told because they, that would risk contamination. Yet they have a bunch of students in there that Colhane later discloses in her opinion made her nervous and she coughed on the bullet. So she's not even wearing a face mask. Surgeon doesn't pull their mask down to say hand me a scalpel because you risk contamination. This is one of the most notorious murder cases in history and Colhane drops protocol by admittedly herself. She, she completely admits to it and then deviates to keep the contaminated evidence in the case. And then when you look at the Bembenic case, the bullets all gone because remember that little flood that uh, supposedly happened, allegedly happened, and Mark Williams has a crime lab, Mike Michael Camp, forge a document and falsify it and put it in the file? Well, come to find out, 
The bimbenic bile is not damaged by flood whatsoever. So where's the bullet? According to the state, it got washed away. It's gone. No bullet to test. Flip back to the Avery case. We got no bones to test. Why? They're gone. They're gone. So that's a big, big deal. Um, let's continue. Number nine. I mean, I keep saying this is a big deal. This is a big deal. We're only hitting on the big deals. I mean, we could have kept going, but we're trying to keep this short. So I'll keep going. Number nine, male DNA from other persons not identified. Male DNA from other persons not identified. We have a bloody handprint, 823 in the Avery case on the back of the cargo door. You cannot put a bloody headed victim in the back of the cargo of the RAV4 without opening that door. It's a bloody handprint. You can get as much DNA test as you want. You can go back and again and again and again. Culhane can only get a partial. So there you go. And it's male DNA in the quarry. CX. You look at the Ben Bennett case, the entire trial, they never come forward and express any, they suppress the entire thing that there's male DNA that suggests sexual assault on Christine Schultz. Now it was recorded that it had been somewhere between 12 and 19 hours since Christine Schultz had had sex with a person that she was in a relationship with. This DNA found was male DNA within her female parts, the identity is suppressed by the state. Who's in charge of the DNA in the case? Oh, let's look. Hmm. Norm gone. Avery case. Norm gone. Ben Bennett case. Norm gone. Who wrote the book on DNA and got awards? Norm gone. Who gave away the evidence? Norm gone. We could make a rap song. Norm gone. Norm gone. I, I can't stand this. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to hold it together for you folks. Okay. <clears throat> 10, easy one. Tunnel vision on a single targeted individual. It couldn't have gotten much more targeted than the Ben Bennett case when her own children who were present, I mean, not her own children, let me back up. Christine Schultz, the murder victim's own children, were present and accounted for in her home and saw a perpetrator leave their property, immediately found their mother bent over the bed, hands tied, blindfolded, and shot in the back. They identified the perpetrator as wearing army gear, a male, black shoes, and a red long ponytail in the back. But yet, the state went with Ben Bennick. She's on the right there. Does she look like she is a male? Does she look like, you know, this guy had a face mask on. The, the, both kids told us. All right, so... How much more targeted could you get on the Avery case when we have, I can count 16 males that have no alibi that not only some of them, just a few of them, but some of them lied about their alibi. Scott Tadich completely lying about his alibi. He did not go see his mother that day and uh, for back surgery at the Green Bay Hospital. Did not, but completely missed work that day. With no call, no show at work. Still don't know what on. But did they investigate that? No. They were more worried about if there was porn on Stephen's uh, computer. What about the fact that um, you look at the Ben Bennett case and the two officers, her husband... His ex-wife is dead. Her husband on duty with a partner stayed there somewhere else. And then when they have to give a more detailed report, it comes out that they're not where they said they were. They're at a bar. It might be on work relate, but they lied about it. They stretched it and they covered it up. 
So with people lying in both cases about their alibis and the cops know it, but they stick their they stick to their guns and they go after Ben Benick and they go after Steve Avery. And number 11, witnesses' testimony to support defense is suppressed. So there are witnesses in both cases that support Stephen. There are witnesses that support Lori Bambenek. But you never hear about them in this trial. We have witnesses that suggest other people were the perpetrators, which happened to align with some of the major suspects in the case, and the police do not even seem interested in those people. And number 12, are you ready? Media was used to pre-trial poison the jury pool. Before these individuals even get to trial, Norm Gone and all of these people have aligned it so that the media is being fed propaganda that makes Ben Benick unbelievably guilty in all the public's eye before they've even picked a jury. Not even one juror is even picked. The they don't even talk about the fact that the children witnessed a male. They don't talk about the DNA of a male suspect in the vagina of the woman that was murdered and had not had sex for 19 hours. They don't talk about any of that. They talk about how Ben Benick didn't want her husband paying the alimony anymore. So she went out of her way to kill this lady. And the public's trusting. And guess what happens in the Avery case? He's guilty before anybody even gets picked for the jury. So that's what we've got for today, you guys. Um, so I'm trying to do it a little bit better so that we get right to the heart of the matter. And that way, if you don't have a lot of time, you can come in, watch that part of the video. If you do have more time, you can hang out for part two, which is beginning now. And that's where we go to the crowd. And um, let me see if I can set this up a little bit. I'm trying to get better at this whole thing, you guys. I'm trying. <laughs> Maybe that gives you something to look at. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. So if you guys want to start giving me what you want to talk about here, let's see how many people we got watching with this tonight. Whoopsie. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm moving the wrong stuff around. Let's just minimize that. We got about 40 people with this, which is great. I'm sure we'll have a lot more viewers. Um, let's go ahead and scroll back up a little bit. Can I make this smaller so it doesn't jump in front of the other one? Can I pop out the chat? Wasn't there a way to pop out chat, you guys? Pop out chat. There we go. All right. So let's see if we can bring this over here and still hold this up and then that way you guys don't have to look at my boring computer screen. Where did chat go? Oh, there it is. It's just really big this way. Well, that's cool. We're getting better at this part. All right, let's scroll up here. Let's see, I need to find if Perry's here. If Perry's here, I wanna give him a wrench so he can help. I don't know if he was able to make the, well, we'll come back to that. All right, guys. So I just want to say hi to everyone. There's a lot of you here. So um, I appreciate you showing up for this and I appreciate your support. Let's see here. From one love to the next, dark side of the moon is saying. Oh, one from, one from one live to the next. Yeah, I was uh, watching Magilla Gorella. Um, or I, I think I said it right. Um, brilliant, you know, very good. And Eric Cozy is doing a great job of promoting a lot of different people that are working to expose the truth. And of course, I'm very supportive of that. And so I wanted to wait and give them their time and, and room and then follow it up with something else to, to think about. Hi, Thread Killer. Hi, Eddie. Uh, let's see. Hi, Ronald. Jamie. Hi. 
um, yeah, dark side. This is this is the blueprint here. I mean, Ben Benek is. It, it literally has all to do with photographs, and uh, we have a photographer in the Avery case, and these cases are involving a lot of the same higher ups at state level. And look at the way states behave in these days. It's it's actually um, it's embarrassing to be a Wisconsinite and know that they've claimed that state of Wisconsin may have given back the victim's family animal bones. We can do better than this. Um, there's a simple test with beetles that can tell you if the bones or a bacteria, I believe, um, if the bones are human or not. And it was done in the Christine Rudy case by Dr. Eisenberg. She could have easily performed the same test. And so the lack of that test not being done when it could have easily been done leaves you very suspicious feeling that they don't want us to know what the bones are. And then to come out and say they may be animal bones. Basically, the state, are you trying to tell us that you've put Brendan Dassey and Stephen Avery behind bars over animal bones? Jamie uh, Van Van Hoot says Sherry Colhan should have been allowed, never allowed to test any evidence in the essay as she was conflict of interest. And this is a very good point, you guys. Um, people are under the impression that Sherry Colhane was the one that exonerated Stephen Avery and that she didn't have anything to do with the 1985 case. So I'm going to clear this up. Sherry Colhane is the lab tech in 1985 that testified against Stephen Avery, identified the hair improperly as Stephen Avery's. That was Sherry Colhane then. When you fast forward 18 years later in 2002, there's a court order that mandates that Sherry Colhane run the computer test now. The DNA has upgraded, if you will, the testing has, and it's no longer in the analysis I view if the person's guilty or not, if it's a match or not. It's now regulated by the computer. And so Sherry Colhane is court ordered to run this test to see if it produces a match for Steve Avery, and it doesn't. It's not a match. So then it's court ordered further that she put that into the FBI codex, and it pumps out that it's Gregory Allen's match. So she sits on that for a full year before she hits that email send button. It's like she's stalling for time because she's like, it's out of my hands, guys, to the boys club. You know, it's it's out of my hands. You better figure out something quick because Stephen Avery is coming out. He's getting out of jail. And um, so it's interesting for those that believe she was not involved in the 1985. That's incorrect. Sherry Colhane was the lab technician that wrongly, wrongly identified Stephen Avery, the hair matching him. So Dark says Van Hollen, there's something about him I don't trust. Something. Whoa. I guess. JB Van Voot Van Hoot says, I call bullshit Williams. Yeah. That's our state lawyer, you guys, you guys, um, butt dialing Zellner and, and playing these games and also telling our state crime lab, you know, it's kinda like you think of Mark Williams telling Michael Camp, um, Hey, make that file disappear and put in a file piece of paper that says it washed away in a flood. And so the state crime lab guy does it, right? Complies with it and gets caught. And they admit that they did this. And then you look over here and you've got Tom Fassbender from the state level saying to the crime technician that's handling the Avery evidence and solely handling the Avery evidence is, again, Sherry Colhane, who was the 1985 lady who didn't help him then is now solely in charge of the evidence, according to Kratz. And she volunteered for it. How convenient. Tom Fassbender's telling her, try to put her in the garage, try to put the victim in the trailer. And what does she do? Um, we have a key that does not have the victim's DNA anywhere on it that she's supposed to own. And yet it's got the big old DNA that spikes up off the top, over the top, for the, sus uh, the suspect that's in the house. So there's the trailer. And then later they have a bullet that has the dust from jacking off the floor or jacking up. I'm sorry, jacking. Well, maybe, maybe that was Freudian slip of what I think they're doing. Um, they were hammer jacking the floor or whatever, breaking up the concrete. And this dust is underneath the bullet. So the bullet appears on top 
which puts it after time. Um, it just, it's been put in the garage, right? So you have again, you got Michael Camp complying and putting that piece of paper in that state file, which wrongfully convicted Ben Benick. And again, you have Sherry Colhane complying, and lo and behold, we have a key planted in Stephen Avery's bedroom with Teresa Halbach's DNA lacking, yet the suspect's DNA on it. You get the bullet that's placed in, you know, planted in the garage, and again, we have a problem with the DNA. It's not blood, it's not bone. It's planted DNA. So... All right, guys. Um, Jamie Van Van Hoot says, truth train full throttle. 327, 2020 KZ. I love it. Okay. Um, let's see what else do we have here. Oh, hey, Turbo. Oh, so you're just, you were Justin. Okay, Kurt. I gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Good to see you. Hi, Roll. How are you doing? Glad to have you on board. Yeah, we're just going through um, this whole thing. I mean, let's look at this one more time. Let me see. Where do I get here? I should be able to move this off here completely. Let's go over this real quick. Number one, both cases exposing corruption. Number two, sloppy Ellie investigation. Number three, Emmy or Coroner threatened, not allowed to do their job right. Number four, alleged murder weapons, unfired, untested. Number five, cla the crime lab, one-time deviation in each case with the same people signing off. Number six, state witnesses purged themselves with the DA knowledge. And let's not even forget that these are state witnesses that were used as, as star witnesses that actually have in common. Their alibis aren't legit and they're actually the defense's main star suspects, right? Number seven, exes were not investigated as suspects. Number eight, bullets were unable to be tested by defense. And they're all gone, right? Number uh, nine, male DNA from other persons not identified. And this is suspect DNA, by the way. Number 10, tunnel vision on single targeted individual. Number 11, witness testimony to support defense suppressed. And number 12, media was used pre-trial to poison the jury pool. Let's go ahead and keep looking what everybody's got to say. So Jamie Van Van Hoot says, I find it suspicious. RH resides in Milwaukee, Wisconsin now, I believe. Yeah, according to Kratz, right? And then... Uh, Turbo says, all corruption ties back to Milwaukee. Jamie says, DSOTM usually, oh, dark side of the moon, usually when you're from a small town around here in Wisconsin, you don't go to a huge city like Milwaukee. Roll says, the bullets are gone. Oh, my God. <laughs> The bullets are all gone, gone. Roll, you, you just, you just said so much. <laughs> mm, I love that. Uh, Jan, uh, Jamie says, I have to agree. Dark side of the moon, that's why it's suspicious to me. Thread killer says, Jamie, I'm pretty sure RH is a nurse. You know, it's interesting when I did his personal background effect, um, his background check, which I paid for on Ryan Hilligus, it says licenses, you know, state licenses, none. How is he a nurse without having a license? Um, Lordy, I don't get that. So I find that interesting. Dark Side of the Moon says, yes, thread killer, and he hassled another nurse and wasn't allowed on that floor she worked in. I read that too. Thread Killer says, yes, military field, I believe. Dark Side of the Moon says, I wonder if Ryan and Mike are still best buddies. Thread Killer says, maybe that's why he's in Milwaukee. So we have a question. Rebecca says, um, let's see. Rebecca Lay Flores. So is the defense falling short or is the evidence being manipulated and withheld? That is a brilliant question. You know, 
I'm not going to judge the defense. I used to be hard on, on beauty and strain, but I have to tell you something. They did not have this many eyes on this case, and it's really unbelievable at the level of the corruption. Would it have been possible for the defense to even be able to think that we would have state-level people helping to cover this up? They were terrified to even point the finger at two corrupt cops in the community. So you have to wonder if they, if, you know, they didn't just do their best. Yes, they did a poor defense job when we look at it by hindsight. And there are some things I can't get over. I can't get over the gentleman's agreement on the identity of the victim. I can't let that go. So in that case, I feel that the defense did drop the ball in many times and, um, you know, if you watched Andrew Whitehead, he expresses how he feels that some of the defense for Brendan's have dropped the ball too, and I feel the same way. And if you look at Dave Bogota, and he just put the video out as well um, about this this club, it's just, you guys, what you don't get is this club is if you really look at what's being said, there were police officers in 1985 gathered at the beach prior to Penny Bernstein being attacked with a dispatch reporting in the case that the reason they couldn't watch Gregory Allen is because all the police officers were responding to a more important event. Yet they're all at the beach where Penny gets attacked. Well, if we go with the theory that all businesses that are successful in that area are part of the club, whether they want to be or not, where does that leave the Bernsteins? So she went on a 15 minute, you know, minute jog and he called the police. Wouldn't you kind of like try to do the jog yourself and meet her halfway, go look for her or ask around? Have you seen my wife? Did she come this way? Um, why are the police already there and not a few but a lot they're centrally located at that exact part of the beach it just makes you kind of wonder do we really get this bigger picture of why they're after Stephen? is it because his family refuses to be part of the club and he threatened one of their club members you know is that possible and um, they took it as a threat like they did Ben Benick, where they were like, uh-huh, you want to flaunt pictures? You want to flaunt a, a gun at one of our members? We'll show you how that works. And they do flaunt. They flaunt back in our face that they can break the law and get away with it. So it's almost like they say, you want to flaunt pictures of other um, cops doing bad things. Well, we'll flaunt how you were a playboy bunny and we'll flaunt how, um, you are the one we're going to frame basically and get away with it. Um, or we'll flaunt the fact that, you know, you burned a cat when it wasn't Stephen that actually burnt the cat. He participated in an event that was unfounded, unforgivable in some ways, but he didn't throw that cat in the fire. And yet the other person wasn't even charged. So, you know, you have to look at it that way and say, how big is this club and who's all participating? Well, who has a successful business? Who is sticking around that area and surviving quite well? Who's blooming? Who's getting promoted? How do you get a promotion? I mean, look at Altoona, you guys, another area that just went, it's all over my news. Um, and I'll get some, so we're going to be doing a video on it. Superintendent Guy Peggs just got caught and charged with sex trafficking. The superintendent of a school right next to Altoona's very close to Eau Claire, like an hour away from where I live or a little more, right? Sex trafficking. And he's charged with it. He was hired because the last guy was so corrupt. Peggs was supposed to come in and repair the damage. He was the bridge to show that we didn't have to fear for our children, sending them to school and stuff. It's all over. And it's the whistleblowers are stepping up. It's the year of the rat. And the whistleblowers are stepping up. And you're going to see a lot more of it coming forward this year, I assure you. 
because all this public publicity is giving the victim strength. Regardless of people think that online has any change in any certain case, I can guarantee you when a victim hears another person publicly speaking about the exact type situation that they've been through, it gives them a sense of normalcy that it's not them. It gives them confidence and it inspires them to step forward and speak of the hell they've gone through, the tragedy they've experienced. So yeah, it does matter that we do these onlines. Um, Debbie says, Debbie, Debbie Salmon says, the press in Wisconsin is terrible. Yeah, it's basically protocol is being followed by watching the prompt, the television, the television prompt, the radio prompt. What did the sheriff's department, which has a radio station right at the top of the letterhead that got faxed, what is the story they want read off? And you can look at the newspapers and they all say the exact same thing. So I should turn a light on. It's gotten dark and then we should, I should get off here. It's, it's getting pretty late, but I wanted to say, um, I want to thank you all. And, uh, that was my summary. So I want to also throw a shout out there to my buddy that's been working really hard with me. Um, and that's who wants truth. He's got a new forum. He's doing really good. Um, please go hit it up. Read his forum. It's on the no crime, no time. How do I do that? Like that down there? See, let's see if I can do this. It's mirrored backwards. Okay. No crime, no time dot org. Go there. That's our community. No, no, no. I can't even talk anymore. <laughs> Need off here, you guys. Paul Van Dort says, hi, Rubber Ducky. We're in the press in the story. Why are they not jumping on this? I don't know. Um, I'm going to be doing a whole bit after this. I'm doing another live. And I just want to get it out there about, I'm just going to start covering when corruption affects our public safety in Wisconsin. And the Altoona superintendent is sex trafficking. He's charged with sex trafficking. I'm going to show some of these. Let's see here. There was some comment. Lisa says, if I remember correctly, Dave B in one of his videos talks about the club members trying to recruit him. He had pictures of local club members and actual sex act. Not only did he say that, but Dave Bogota told us that there was a coach in one of these pictures. You know, there were teachers in these pictures it's basically, you want to know who the club is? It's anybody that's willing to bend to the blackmail because there's dirt on you. You're dirty and you're doing something like sex trafficking. You're doing something like blackmailing other people. And so you're part of the club because you're willing to take part of it. And if you want a successful business in those areas, like Dave said, you either comply or people end up dead or their businesses are shut down and they don't prosper. Um, businesses get boycotted. Look at the Avery. They got boycotted. Nobody wanted to send their vehicles there. Well, that really helps out Robert Herman, who ends up being the sheriff after the Avery case, doesn't it? Because it really helped him. I got to let Gretchen out. It really helps him when all the business is being given to his business. And it really hurts the Avery case, doesn't it? Because now the Averys can't afford to do anything and they, they, they can't even live. They have no business. So it really supports the concept that Dave's explaining to you guys that he says, we don't understand. Think about it. You guys really think about it. What were they benefiting in discrediting Avery? They weren't going to pay $36 million. Um, Robert Herman, the sheriff that's of Mantua County, is benefiting with all the business he gains because the Averys don't get it. They don't get the business, so. Paul Van Dort says something, and we're going to leave off on this point. And he says, if the press cannot be independent, that is really bad. That's why we're making our own channel. 
because YouTube likes to censor us and so do other YouTubers. Um, we, they don't like the way we do our research and they'll get all over me. I've had people say I lie. I've had people say I stretch the truth. Prove it. I don't. I'm just reporting this stuff. I'm not the one that said this. I'm not the one that said that. I'm the one sharing with you what's being said. I'm the journalist. I'm the messenger, right? And I might have got some things wrong in my lifetime. If I do, I try to come back to them and correct it if I can. The, the thing about it is this. We have to be independent in our research because we complement each other. We also produce a certain amount of standard to hold ourselves to. So it's important. And on that mo note, um, I'm going to go ahead and type this out. I want to thank you, and I'm going to do another live following this up. It'll be about, we're going to have an intermission, about 10 minutes, and then I'm going to the Altoona superintendent that is locally charged with sex trafficking in Wisconsin. And then we'll see if there's any other counties that are having any issues with corruption as well. All right. Thank you all. Have a great night. Now i got to figure out how to close this. <laughs> Mm-hmm.